Hello, it's Scott Manley here, enjoying the great Scottish summer weather. Yes, it's, um, well, we had a storm last night. It's still overcast right now, but at least I don't have to wear waterproofs right now. So uh, I figured I'd make some videos, you know, just you know, talking at camera type things, telling stories of spaceflight. And I want to talk about Sputnik 3 because, well, people talk about Sputnik 1 all the time. It was a huge, you know, moment in the history of the world. It was a real kick up the butt for the US uh, space program because they were second. Sputnik 2, people talk about that. It was the first animal in space and how that was really cool to launch an animal into space unless you were that animal which ended up getting cooked alive pretty much due to thermal problems. But Sputnik 3 was Soviet Union's first scientific satellite and it was actually supposed to be the original Sputnik 1. So if we rewind to the early days of the Soviet space program, um, you know, Soviet Union basically follows on from the US saying, yeah, we're going to launch a satellite in the International Geophysical Year 1957. And they start pitching it around and you start designing it. And they start designing this very big, complicated satellite. See, they were building the R7 rocket, which was capable of launching five ton thermonuclear warhead from bases in the Soviet Union into the US. This would obviously be a transformative moment in terms of global politics, but being able to launch a five ton suborbital payload meant that if they cut the payload down to like 1.2 tons, they might be able to put it into orbit. That was the plan, that was the pitch. And so Karolyev was working on a satellite that was very, very capable. It had like over a dozen scientific instruments that were capable of analyzing the near space environment, various types of radiation, ion detectors, electron counters, micrometeorite impact sensors. All of this was fed through a telemetry system which had a recorder and there was like a transponder and everything on board. This was actually, this was a really, big piece of hardware, especially when you compare against the other things that were being built at the time. Now, when Khrushchev took over, by the way, in the Soviet Union, literally days after he's you know, denouncing the crimes of Stalin, he turns up to visit Karolyev to say, hey, what have you got for me? What have you been doing all this time? And uh, Karolyev explains about the R7 missile and the ability to basically hit inside Russia, and Khrushchev really likes that. But he also talks about the satellite, and the satellite he talks about isn't Sputnik 1, it's Sputnik 3, it's this big mock, it's a mock-up at this time, but it's got like the idea of having all these scientific instruments in space. And he sells Khrushchev on that idea. Like there had been people obviously approving of the idea of the satellite, but the fact that Khrushchev saw this and approved of it, that was sort of relevant. So anyway, flash forward in time. As they're getting close, you know, to the middle of 1957, it's becoming clear that uh, the satellite that they are developing isn't going to work on the R7 rocket as it's built because the engines aren't performing quite as well as, as they expect. There's a bit more extra mass, the uh, specific impulse is a bit lower, and also the satellite, which is called Object D, and by the way, it's called Object D because objects A, B, and V are all thermonuclear warheads, so this is like the next letter in the alphabet, or the Cyrillic alphabet. Uh, so anyway, this is one is clearly becoming too heavy uh, and it's behind schedule. It's not, you know, they're having technical problems that they need to solve. So that's when the original Sputnik 1 comes along and they build that up very quickly. It's a whole lot lighter, it's a whole lot simpler. And since the goal is to beat the Americans into space, it's what ends up getting launched first. And with that out of the way, you know, Karolyev and his friends, they want to relax, they want to celebrate, but uh, no, Khrushchev says, hey, you know, we've got this like Soviet anniversary in November. Do you think you can launch something for that? So they're like, they throw together this quick program based on previous suborbital launches and they launch Sputnik 2. And then they get a bit of time to actually relax and work on Object D, this actual project that they'd wanted to do for a long time. So to get this into space, they have to modify the R7 rocket. They use like a chemical etching to reduce the mass of some of the baffles inside the tanks. They find places to save mass and they adjust the engine throttling. So the outside boosters are throttled higher, the core is throttled lower, and this lets it get further down range with more of its propellant before the stages kick off. Meanwhile, yeah, they're building out Object D, they're solving all the various problems with that. They actually build two of them, which proves to be good because in the first launch in August of, 19, oh, sorry, so April of 1958, 
uh, they, they take off and about a you know, minute into the flight they start to get these pogo oscillations and these get worse and worse and eventually the boosters get torn off by these oscillations. This rocket is lost, the satellite ends up landing downrange and apparently, according to some sources, this satellite was actually recovered, brought back and they wanted to see if they could use it again. They take a panel off and uh, it, then an electrical short happens and the thing catches fire. So yeah, there's a bit of a post-flight investigation where they decide that uh, there was problems where they were too aggressive with their thrust profiles. It left too much uh, potential for internal oscillations in the vehicle. So they dial that back a little. And then in May, they're ready for their second launch attempt. And this one, it does have some vibrations, but it's not enough to take the vehicle out of commission. And it does eventually go into orbit. Sputnik 3 enters orbit. Now, an interesting thing, by the way, about the early days of the space race is that the first satellites launched launched by the Soviets were very, very short-lived. Like, they, they lasted a few weeks, couple of months in space. And, like, the US ones, they went up and they stayed up for months or even years. In fact, Vanguard won the very first American satellite, uh, sorry, the second satellite, the first satellite launched on the Vanguard rocket. Long story. It's actually still in space, you know, 50, 60, 60-something years later, many years later. I can't do math right now. I'm tired. Jet-lagged. Um, and, and so anyway, like, you've got to understand that there was periods where, despite the Soviet Union being the first into space, that the US was the only nation with stuff working in space. So getting Sputnik 3 up, that was a bit of a good thing for them. And the fact is that Sputnik 3 was so much more massive. It was more than all the previous satellites that had been launched. It was like a hundred times the mass of Vanguard. This thing was over a ton. It was like a ridiculous monster spacecraft that was able to do a lot more than all the other US you know, and spacecraft. So anyway, it starts doing science. And unfortunately, there are some technical problems. One of the things that fails is the data recorder. So they can only get data when the spacecraft is flying over Soviet base stations. And that means that they're having to piece together the scientific data from what they can get now rather than what it sees throughout the entire orbit. And this leads to an interesting uh, event in space science. So the US had, of course, launched Explorer 1. And it was flying, and it was flying through these Van Allen belts, and that was tripping its uh, radiation detector to the point where it would fail completely. But the US had, had a, like, sites that were able to retrieve the data at lower latitudes where the Van Allen belts come closer in. Soviet Union, they were at higher latitudes, they didn't have the recorder. So while they were getting close to the Van Allen belts, they weren't getting the absolute strong signature that the US satellites were getting. And when they, while they did see some evidence of radiation levels in ion, you know, rising up in a way that they didn't expect, the scientist that was looking at this, he actually wrote this off as being like cosmic rays hitting into the metallic structure of the spacecraft and knocking off electrons and protons. And, you know, that was what his argument was. And he wrote like his studies up in that way. And a while later, when Van Allen and friends published their data on the Van Allen belts, he realized that he had misinterpreted the data that was coming from Sputnik 3. And if he'd had access to the complete recording, if the spacecraft hadn't failed, then they could well have been called whatever the name of that researcher was. I forget his name. But you know, they had the data in hand, although obviously Explorer 1 had been there first. Yeah, it is interesting that this is something the Soviet Union missed out on. And this is actually quite a common theme in Soviet, early Soviet space research, that there's so much focus on getting things done first that they actually miss opportunities for scientific and engineering advancements, which would help them further down the line. You know, from the very earliest days of the space program, the Soviet space program, they were so focused on getting things done first that they just couldn't actually keep up in the long term. They were focused on like sprinting when in fact it was a marathon. That's one way of putting it. Um, so yeah, Sputnik 3, it, uh, orbit, it operated for about three weeks and it would stay in orbit ultimately until 1960. It was the satellite that once it launched, there was like a continuous Soviet presence in space from that point forwards. And uh, yeah, it's the one that nobody talks about. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.